you need one of those do what I want, not what I say type interpreters. Yes, I have a function key for that. It's right next to the any key. Let's see. Huh. I'm working. Oh, we're getting <laughs> getting closer. Yeah, closer. Oh. All right, are we there now? Are you, you see the screen okay? Yes. All right, very good, took a little while. All right, this is an extended longer chat. Uh, I talk rapidly. Um, if you have, if you listen more rapidly than I talk and get done before I do, then you could free to leave. I won't be offended. <laughs> this, 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 um, this is an exploration of learning to program forth by programming a game. Now I see by the amount of gray hair in the audience here that most of you are, are well beyond the material I'm going to cover. However, there are some techniques that are used and in particular a programming methodology that I'm going to promote that uh, could benefit uh, by all. Now, this is actually one of three parts. Uh, I'll probably say this again a little bit later on, but uh, we're going to learn how to program the game today. A uh, second episode later on will be how to do scoring, and a third episode will be how to develop winning strategy. So for our programming methodology, I always think it's very good to look at other people's code. Once you've learned the, the fundamentals and basics, you can learn a lot by reading other people's codes. You learn techniques. You'll say, why did they do that? And how does it work? So our game, the programming style I'm going to use is interactive and repetitive. Uh, some steps forward, some steps backwards, just really like real life, lots of testing. Um, you don't necessarily see it on the screen here, but every time I write a fourth word, I write a one or two line test for that fourth word in the source code and I leave it in the source code. So every time I recompile, I'm actually executing all the tests of all the words. Uh, I use uh, Win432 and even with all of the test routines built in, the recompile is still about two seconds. So I get to recompile the entire situation, entire game, entire program with all the test routines. It still takes two seconds. And if along the way I make some kind of a change, it will appear immediately. So lots of steps, lots of testings. Now here are a number of the basic fourth words. I kind of approach this like you might on a chess, a learning chess. These are the words that you need to learn from reading a book, from seeing a reference. You just, they're like, learning alphabet, learning numbers. Uh, you learn each one individually without a context, without any other, uh, the, the vocabulary that we work from. Then once you've learned these basic words, which are like basic chess moves, then we go on to technique and strategy. And if the words are new to you, then go to Starting Forth by Leo Brody, which is quite available online. So as I mentioned a moment ago for newcomers, Reading other people's source code is a great way to learn the syntax and programming style and new techniques. So here's an important message for today. I'm going to apply a four-level process 
Now, most of you probably do this in your head already, but uh, you may skip steps. And I found it is very helpful, literally in my source code or on scratch paper to uh, write down these steps as I go. And as I said, old timers are doing this, but uh, it's always worth a refreshment. Also, since computer memory is so huge and computers are so blindingly fast, take advantage, use long names, factor into many small words. Don't worry about the, the time it takes to get from word to word or time lost on large names and text. You get clarity and testability. And when you come back to them later on, it will be helpful. Now here's the vocabulary of our game words that we're going to use. Some of these are kind of generic, like full game, player input, place a symbol, range checks, current player, start, and so on. And other words are specific to the particular game. So here is the process that I propose to use, four steps. The first step is discovery, the aha moment. What have we learned? How does it lead to a uh, closer step to completion? After your discovery, then you need to respond to that. So you state in steps the next words, pseudocode or stack diagram. What's your, how are you going to implement? What's it supposed to do? Finally, you write the source code and then, finally, and then you test. The discovery and design can often be about a third of your time. The coding would be 20% of your time. And then the testing would probably be something around 40% of your time. In other words, I spend more time writing test routines than I do writing the code because the test routines have to uh, accommodate uh, variations. And also, of course, I'm finding a lot of typing mistakes in my code. So when I recompile, the biggest obstacle is getting the typing mistakes out. So on to the game. The discovery is the statement. Let's program the game. And our design, it says it's going to be tic-tac-toe, or as it's known in the mother country, knots and crosses. A nine square board. On the left, we see a game uh, with, the, with the zero X's and O's placed. On the right-hand side are the cell numbers. They're numbered sequentially, uh, left to right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So wherever a number appears, it's referring to that particular cell on the playing board. So we'll divide up our uh, overall game. The first phase is information storage. Then we need data access methods. Once you've got ability to get data in, we need to do formatting error checks. And finally, we play the game. If you were doing a project plan, you would do your time budgeting and your staffing based on these four phases. So, when we see this game that I'm presenting today, it appears very logical, and very straightforward. And I'll say, nay, 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 not so in real life. I redesigned this game and ripped it up at least three times uh, and ended up with a program design at the end that was quite a bit different than how it started. So we'll get right into the core of it now. We need a storage method to store the nine square game. And I've named that action. Action has nine cells in it. We first, we define the number of squares as nine. That number nine will be used over and over and over again. So of course we give it a name and it's number of squares. The bottom line says we'll create the, uh, the storage area action. And with number of square cells a lot, we have allocated nine cells into action. Do a quick check, just type action number of squares, which is nine. Cells multiplies that by four to give us 36, which is the number of cells and the number of bytes we're gonna look at. And then we dump. Remember, of course, dump works on, on bytes and our memory uh, storage is in by cells, which are four bytes per uh, uh, data cell. Now let's do another way of testing. Uh, we're going to create storage for the for the nine square game, but we're going to preload numbers. In this case, we're still going to, to allocate the storage, but we'll preload the numbers. So instead of using a lot, I'm actually using comma to put in the, the numbers. So in our array action, we'll just store the numbers one through nine numerical order. This allocates the storage space and it preloads the numbers in them. Now, if I uh, use dump again, 
if I go to action, the number of square cells dump. Now I will see the area, area of memory as before, but under the circles, you can see the numbers zero, two, three, uh, pardon the numbers one through uh, nine in decimals. There, there are four bytes, 32 bit uh, uh, per cell, four, four bytes per cell, and they contain the numbers zero through nine. Quick check. A lot of times in these game systems, you're going to have a, a trouble between are they zero based or one based? And this quick dump will let you know uh, if you made a, an early mistake. So in this programming style on this screen, I'm not showing the stack diagrams and the comments on the definitions, but they're essential you include them because I will do projects where I come back to something maybe a year later. And it's very important that I have uh, these, these values recorded so I can read my own code later on. So for example, here's a sample, the uh, insert CR, uh, the purpose is this uh, accepts a number N at the beginning and the longer description says we insert a CR every third value of N. That is we, we do a return every third value. So next step we need to be able to read and write symbols into our action. So the first word is right square or right uh, or square store. In this case, it accepts a square number and the pound sign represents a symbol that's going to go into that square. And so here we write the symbol into a square and the definition of course is action, rotate, one minus cells plus store. The, the complement to that is to read from a square. So that's square fetch. And it does exactly the same accessing, but instead of using a store, it uses a fetch. Now, it's very important that these are the only two words that access into action. They're the only two words that get access to our game board. And I'll touch on that a little bit more in a moment. Here's a test on those. The 40, the 4-77 says in square four, take the numeric value 77 and store it into that square. 588 squares stores the value of 88 into square five and so on. The next block, the second black row from the bottom, four square fetch, fetches the contents of square four, dot prints it, same with square five and square six. And then finally we see 77, 88 and 99. Now this is the kind of testing that I leave in my source code so that if along the way, I end up making a, uh, a, a major significant uh, early change, it will be revealed as soon as possible. Here are some style conventions. Uh, most of you probably already follow something like this, but adding the out sign, the at sign means fetching from memory, typically the square fetch. Adding exclamation point to store, so square store means storing into a square. And finally, dot means printing something like dot game means print the game. Uh, these conventions make the code again more readable to an experienced fourth programmer. And finally, the greater than and less than is often meaning to and from. Another element that's important is that our action board is, is uh, runs addressing the cells from zero through eight, whereas our game squares are one through nine. So we have to make that offset. And again, this is done in one place only. And for writing, it's in square store. And for reading, it's in square fetch. And that one minus does the offset. Uh, if it's, you, you want to concentrate the, um, uh, the, the um, uncertainties or the change or the confusion in the smallest number of places possible. So let's see what the game contents are. I'll define a, a word called dot game. It's a simple do loop. It uses square fetch. The do i square fetch dot loop addresses sequentially the squares one through nine, which inside the game we know are zero through eight, and they're printed out. So we see one, two, three, and then the 77, 88, and 99, which we just placed. And the seven, eight, and nine were there from when it was originally initialized. But this doesn't look like a real game. Uh, we really want to get it onto a grid three by three. So that's where we use the word three dash CR. 
In this case, uh, it does some modular arithmetic and inserts a return every third line. Now we redefine the game, dot game, uh, using that three dash CR uh, indication. And sure enough, now we see the game board. Same values that have been uh, carried forward. One, two, three, 77, 88, 99, 789. So we've done our early testing. We know we got the board set. We know we've got the uh, access to it. We need to clear the board. So that's a very simple uh, clear game a word in which we store zero into each square. Again, we're building our tools up. We're doing our testing as we go. Now we say clear game, dot game to see the game. And sure enough, we're back to all zeros. And again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, oh, now for those of you learning fourth, uh, the do loop is sometimes a little complicated or a little confusing because the uh, do loop goes from an initial value to one less than the terminating value. So in this word clear games, we have the number of squares as the terminating value and one as the initial value. But this will only run from one through eight because it will terminate one before the final value. So I put a one plus in. This takes the, uh, the uh, nine, converts it to 10. And now the do loop will run from one through nine. A little, uh, little road mine that takes uh, newcomers a little bit to get over. Now we need to put, uh, play symbols. Notice how we're doing this sequentially. We set up our board, we set up access to the board, and now we want to put symbols in. So I'm going to define X and O as numeric values. X is defined as one, and O is defined as two, and zero is defined as an empty square. So we develop the words X store and O store, which simply place the value of one X into, into, a, into a square. O star puts the value of two into a square. Again, layer by layer, tool by tool, we're now generating a game vocabulary. Let's test that. Again, inline testing all the way, we clear the game. One star, one X star, two X star, three X star puts an X in square one, two, three. Seven zero star, eight O score, nine O score, puts an O into seven, eight and nine. Look at the game and we say, perfect, in line. Now remember, this looks so linear, straight, so straightforward, but you're gonna find out along the way, uh, you're, you're catching the mistakes, the logic, the typing errors through abundant testing. So we now can place the values into the game. Uh, let's show them as if this would be in a game that we were, we were playing. So our, our, that's our discovery phase, our design phase. says, if the uh, stored number is zero, print the square number. If it's empty, don't print a zero, print the square number. If the stored number is one, print an X. If the stored number is two, print O. And guess what? With four of the four-way branch, we need a case statement. And as I mentioned uh, before, the input cell number is duplicated and incremented at O. Oh, in, what, what, you, what you will notice in the code is that this uh, entry of a value is a running sequence. It starts with a cell number, it inputs that cell number, it increments, and then passes the incremented cell number to the next uh, 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 use of that word. So dot square is a beautiful case statement. Again, for new fourth programmers, this might be your first introduction to the use of case. In this case, this is the uh, uh, classic uh, uh, case statement. Uh, that's uh, been around since the uh, uh, early 80s. It's, it's an input number comes in, it's duplicated, we fetch from that square. If for case zero, if there's an, uh, a zero value in the square, that uh, the case number or the square number is duplicated and printed. However, if it's a one, uh, then you print an X. And if the two, you print an O, and then finally, after the end case, there's a one plus. So this passes the square number to the next use of this number. And down below the testing, one dot square, four dot square, seven dot square. Uh, 
uh, it shows that a, an X is in the square number one, four is in square number uh, four, and zero is in square number seven. And those are the values that are, that are circled on the uh, chart at the bottom right. Now, I want to see a more realistic display. This is really like the tic-tac-toe game is that we all play. In between the squares, we want to put a vertical bar, a stick, or a, uh, you know, uh, uh, the vertical bar. And between the rows, a line of dashes. This lends itself toward uh, ASCII and character graphics. So our bits and pieces are, first, we want to put out three numbers with a little stick bar in between, one, two, three. That's a typical row. The dashes are a separator. And now we do a quick prototype of the game. This is not the real game, but it's just a quick uh, verification, primarily to get the spacing lined up. So we do a return. We do the three numbers, dashes, numbers, dashes, numbers. And here's what we see. We see a fairly realistic tic-tac-door board. Now, remember, this is not a live board. Uh, the one, two, threes are just text printed in as placeholders. And again, this is mostly to get the spacing lined up. So now we go to a live game. We now take three numbers and we use our previous, uh, we modify three numbers now to actually fetch from the square number. So we start with the square number. The, we see a new line, dot square prints the contents of that square, either an X, an O, or the cell number. Then we dot print our uh, vertical bar. We do the middle square, we do the right-hand square. So this does one line, three numbers in a row. And to test them, of course, we just say number one, three numbers, and it goes XXX, which is the top row of our table, which is, which is all Xs. Or if we do the seventh, uh, starting at the seventh cell, uh, we see the three Os. And now we're getting pretty close to a realistically looking game. Under the current test conditions, dot game shows the three rows of Xs at the top, empty four, five, and six in the middle, and then three Os at the bottom. So let's place the, uh, uh, the uh, characters manually. We'll just use the X store and O scare to place markers. We'll clear the game and for testing, we go one X store, that puts an X in square one, two O store, puts an O in the second square, three X store, and so on. Now we have preloaded the game with four symbols and we know everything is working properly. Now it gets a little more complicated because we're getting into the actual game. We need to keep track of the, uh, the uh, play we're on. So we start out with a number that is the number of unending the game. There are nine unplayed squares. So that's a value. Now you remember, again, for newcomers, value when executed yields its internal value. So the, the value unplayed means whenever it executes, we will get the contents of that value. The word current player uh, retrieves the, uh, the uh, uh, odd or even. The unplayed one and is a programming trick because it takes the number that's stored in unplayed, one and determines if it's odd or even. If it's an odd number, it's going to be an X play. If it's an even number, it's going to be an O play. Now to start the game, we clear the game and we set the number of squares to nine, which means uh, no squares have been played. And as I said before, we've had uh, uh, no error checking so far, uh, but on the user interface, we do need to allow for range checking, test for errors and early exits. And I break these down into components, which is typical with the fourth style. So the user inputs an ASCII key to convert to a decimal number. So in that case, uh, we subtract the bias from that, which uh, 49 will, with subtracting the bias will give us a decimal one and so on. So here's the code for ASCII to a number. Uh, we take the value for ASCII zero and subtract it. Now in this fourth, ASCII zero uh, returns the ASCII value of zero. 
And that's simply subtracted from the input number. And again, testing below. More housekeeping. We need a range check. The discovery says, what if the user inputs negative numbers or numbers beyond nine? So in this case, the range check will do a uh, will give us an error flag. A range question will, if it's out of range numerically, we'll get an error signal. If it's the square is empty, again, we'll get an error a flag. Finally, we are alternating play between all between X's and O's. And so here we place a symbol. Current player will figure out, uh, we'll get the number of the player. And remember, it returns an odd value or a true for X and a zero for O. So they finally, the PS actually places the symbol, uh, which is a short version. Place symbol is the, uh, will puts a value into a square, but PS for testing, does the very same thing, but PS allows us to write our testing very briefly. So we see in the black line testing, we'll start the game. One PS puts the first character, which we know has to be an X into square one. Three PS puts the next character into scale three, and that has to be an O uh, because it's an even play. Four PS, uh, puts a value of X into the fourth cell, 6PS puts a value of O into the sixth cell, and so on down. Again, this is testing. Are we able to get our plays in a logical order into the proper cells? And here's the whole game. We're gonna process, actually we're gonna process one game. I won't read the whole code down here, but you get the idea. We are allowing, we're accepting one keystroke. If it's an escape, we notify an exit true, otherwise we convert the uh, uh, value to a square number, we place it. We decrement and place again and again and again until we've done nine plays. So here's our ever popular D chart on the entire player input. It's a do loop that begins. We get the message, we accept input, we test for escape. If the player wants to get out, hits escape, he'll exit true and we're done. Otherwise, we do some error checks on range. And if it's uh, uh, the, the uh, nine plays have occurred, we exit false. If on the other hand, we still have plays to make, we say pick another and we, we uh, play again. And here's the corresponding code, which we will step over. So here is a single play input. We just type player input and X puts in the number two and you see where the red arrow is. In cell two, it has now placed the player's X. And a full game, this will be placed into a loop. There's two exits. One way is you play all nine squares or the other exit is you escape. Now remember, there is no scoring at this point. So we will have to place all nine squares. If scoring was done, the game could end earlier. Here's our full D chart all the way down to uh, place the play. We continue to place the plays uh, in a loop basis until unplayed is zero. Unplayed starts at nine, works down eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. When it's at zero, the game's over and we exit. And simply, this is the full game. A begin uh, until the begin loop starts with player uh, with display the game and player input, and this will be played over and over again until finally a, a, a uh, zero value ends at the end, and that means the all plays have been scored. And here is uh, you know simulated play uh, part way through the game where we're now putting in uh, X value into square nine. Now here's the actual gameplay live. So here's the full game started. We tell the operator enter escape to exit, put in a square number, the input for O, they put a, a notice how now they're filling in the, the uh, we're down at square four, which gets an O, we're down at square five, which gets an X, square six gets an O, where seven gets an X, 
where not eight gets an O and nine gets an X. So that is a live play of one full game round. I'll recycle that so we can see it again. And notice what I've done too. It took some amount of effort, but I was able to find a way to do screen capture using um, uh, Pinnacle 24. It has buried in it a screen capture program. So I was able to enlarge the screen and bring up the live play. Let's look at it again. We tell an operator for square X, put a number in, operator puts in an X, prompt them for an O, they put in the O for, uh, they put a two for uh, the O. And now square by square, the game is being played. And notice, of course, since there's no scaring, the, uh, the game will always go across all nine squares. So what have we accomplished? Well, we have the core now for playing and scoring tic-tac-toe. But notice with a small number of changes, this structure could be changed for other board games. For example, if we change number squares and a little bit more, we will now play the game and we'll show a 64 uh, character square. With proper cell uh, and, and symbol checking, we could convert this to be a checkers game or a chess game. Another very, very important point, as I mentioned at the start, that the storage for the board is in action, and we only have two words that access that action. So that if we modify this game in the future, we only have to modify those two words. And as a teaser for the future, I found out from scoring the game, it is much better to go to bit storage rather than cell storage. So in the scoring game, we put the entire game into one fourth uh, 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 storage value, which is four bytes. So instead of having 36 bytes for a game, we end up having four bytes. And I only had to change one word or two words to accomplish that. As you all know, we could have written the full game as an integral program, but we break it into many small words. And now we have the beginning of the game language. And by having many, many small words, we facilitate testing. And as I said before, I ripped this program up about three times. I first did it with cells, then I did it to bytes, and then I did it to bits. And so you don't know in advance which one is gonna work for you. So my guidance is just jump right in. Again, these are posted. Go to Bill Ragsdale at GitHub and under fourth projects, you'll see it. And also this is in Win32 fourth. And I have written an 80 page guide to Win32 fourth. So at the same GitHub, you will see the Win32 fourth guide. Again, an 80 page uh, uh, guide. Do we have any questions? I see we stand speechless in awe. Does Win32 Fourth have a, have a corollary on the Macintosh? No, no. It's uh, it's uh, Andrew McEwen wrote it, and uh, um, uh, on the PC days back in the eighties, uh, mid eighties, and uh, who was it? Uh, Dudley, who was it that did the uh, did the the rebuild on it uh, after after Andrew? I'm blanking out on the name, but anyway. No, I Zimmerman comes to mind, I believe. Uh, that not, yes, okay. Um, well, unfortunately, no, I spent put great store by Win32 Fourth. It will run on anything from Fourth XP onward. It was read, re, uh, it was brought up to date about five years ago by a German team uh, who polished it and added in the original version, for example, doesn't support scroll wheel and uh, cut and paste it very well. And the, the current version, version six up, um, has very nice human factors. Um, it's, it's integrated IDE. Um, I've tried other systems and it's the only one I know that you can just load and go. You don't have to, you don't have to do any tweaking or tailoring or interfacing to editing programs, it's just load and go. And it's of course, full graphics. Any other questions? 
Did yeah, Rick Van Norman have a piece of that? I didn't see him on credits, no. Anton Ertl was very heavy in it. And um, 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 I'm having a, a, mental, a mental block on it. What's, what's, what's Zimmerman's first name? That, uh, that Tom. Tom Zimmerman. But I think you're talking about um, Josh Vern or something, UK guy that's doing it now. Yes. It's, it's um, Tom Zimmer. Zimmer. Tom yeah. Zimmer, yeah. yeah. Tom it's, Zimmer, it's, there it's we Tom. go. Thank you. Thank you. I, He's not doing it anymore. He, he It's now Josh. Yeah. <laughs> And again, I put great store to the uh, European group that uh, picked it up about 2005 and worked on it off and on for about five years or so. Um, and um, uh, when you load it, it recompiles totally. It's complete with a meta compiler. And when you load it, source comes in with a, with a compiler and it recompiles and configures automatically to your system. Uh, and again, Josh, my, book is a, my book is a miracle because there's no document, extremely limited documentation uh, on how to use it. It does come internally with some, um, uh, you know, very well written information, but um, more on the what rather than the how. And so my book takes the what and turns it into the how, and also goes into detail on a lot of the internal construction. Um, the only other way is you go to the read the source code. And of course it has a beautiful link. If you type view in a word, it will run you to the source code uh, for that word. But a lot of times you're looking at words, trying to read the source code to figure out what the ground rules are. Yeah, how do you, how do you, how do you get around the, uh, the various virus, virus protection? program issues with uh, with Win32 fourth or do you or have you come across it even I uh, that to 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 me it is not you will get uh, virus detection alerts alerts that say uh, uh, you know your program has now been put in the sandbox and you have to recover it um, I think on my virus protect, maybe I put in a, an exemption on that. Uh, um, uh, the originators are the, the you know the co-authors claim it's not a problem. I'm surprised if you get a virus alert on on some, of them. but I think it might be on some. Some of the uh, you know, running, running on older Windows systems. Now you, you figure out how to tell your virus protection software to ignore that folder, that file. You just have to do it. Um, they haven't figured out a way. There's an effort to try to do a new version that isn't detected as a virus, but they have not made that work yet. No. Yeah. I think fundamentally the problem is that a lot of the virus detectors have gotten to the point where they they don't look for specific sub strings in the in the in the uh, the file, but look for certain patterns and things like a meta compiler just tickle it like crazy, and so you're you know short of having a single canonical pre baked version that that somebody signs and then do, does the effort of chasing down Microsoft to convince them to to no. allow us to the it's just not going to work. So, uh, it's one of the key points with this is that it makes it really hard to to teach fourth. Uh, you know, I'm involved with the university and I teach classes and telling them that, you know, hey, I want you to download this program and oh, by the way, tell your antivirus program to <laughs> ignore it. Uh, you know, that's yeah. that's a non-starter right there. The only thing that I've found that that works uh, and, and just to be clear, I have not yet taught a class to students about fourth. But if I were going to, um, the only thing I found that works is there are a couple of force that will run and then have to do more and then just go and you know do the do the work online. 
Uh, that seems to be a, a way of getting around. At least in terms of well, capabilities that they need for education, they seem like they'll do everything that like a regular fourth will do. Uh, another another option um, that that kind of gets around it, although it may fall into that same category of uh, not being a thing administrators would be fond of, is uh, if you turn on the Windows subsystem for Linux, you can actually run GeForce on the Windows machine as well, and that uh, yeah. that works well as well. Yeah, and, and you know it's, it's interesting because as an educator, one of the things that I've run into multiple times is is the amazing computers that students will have. They'll have a Windows 7 machine, they'll have a Windows 10 machine, they'll have a, you know, a very few of them will have a Linux machine. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the students are just using a tablet, you know. So, um, yeah, the only thing I've ever found that really compensates for everything is just focusing exclusively on stuff that you can do on the web. It's, it, yeah. it's rather frightening that we've gotten to the point that folks are so so thoroughly locked out of their computer that the only place to develop is on the web where they're not even really running it on their own system or they're running it only in the sandbox, the browser. But Yeah, yeah you don't really own your machine. <coughs> right. I'll point out. I also, I, also, I also like the Win32 4th 2 because it's, uh, uh, you know, it's fairly easy to set up file access and also to... Uh, you know, talk to a, a com ports, for instance, to do serial in and out and stuff like that. Not, not real easy. It's you know, it's still you have to get through all the Windows junk in the in between. But, but once you have you know a, a uh, there's some examples on doing serial, for instance, in in the examples. But uh, doing um, uh, files once you once you got a got one set up, I always just just use the same same setup over and over again. To, and I always just just load that ahead of time, so that I can I can set up my uh, input and output files. Brad, can you adjust your camera so we can see your mouth and make sure it's you talking? Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, scan I'm, st I'm for whatever reason I'm having a little bit of a network issue. I think I'm, something's interfering. So I'm standing at the corner of the the structure I'm in to be closer to the, the other building that has my router. <laughs> I'll say that Dwight is light years ahead of me on doing Windows interfacing, but Win32 4th has some 19,000 constants declared that are the input parameters in talking to Windows. And um, their usage is totally beyond my capacity. So, yeah. Well, they, they, there, are, there are some examples in the, uh, in the example stuff for a lot of that <laughs> stuff. That's the only way I could figure it out. As a matter of fact, I was going, how the hell do I do serial? And then somebody said, well, just look at the examples here. Look at that serial file, you know, and sure enough, I was able to, uh, I, it, you know, because I'm on a machine. I, I didn't realize if you just talk to uh, the COM1 or COM2 or whatever, it, it sets and you have a machine that only has USB. Windows already sets up the USB for you. All you have to do is just, you know, talk to that one. What I don't like is oftentimes if you reboot the machine and you plug in some dongle on there, it oftentimes gives you another serial port. You got to hunt down which serial port, you know, COM1, COM3, COM32, whatever it is. Then every now and again, there's a real tedious process of cleaning all that stuff out because you can only go, I think, up to 100 or something or other like that on COM ports, and then you have to start all over again. And that's an annoyance. But other than that, it, is, it isn't too bad. But <laughs> Windows does do the hookup to the USB for you. So you can use a, you know, what are those uh, F, FT, whatever it is, uh, FT, compatible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or, you know, even if you're using it for your uh, uh, Ar Arduino work, for instance, you can use it for that as well. So, you know, it's, uh, it, isn't, it isn't too, too horrible. And uh, uh, and of course, this is John. Of course, we have the full Win32 fourth available uh, with yeah. the source on GitHub. You've yeah. seen it before. It's not up right now. I don't know why, but yeah, the source is there. Yep. And of course, you can use John's John's interface to actually execute fourth. <laughs> And and he has that posted someplace, right, John? 
it works fine and, and you can write files and read files back from so it's it's, it's a pretty good yeah. piece of work he yeah. and dudley did it dudley ackerman yeah 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 it it's you know with the windows interfaces are clumsy but but it works it isn't uh in uh in in uh, uh f fpc right i used to go directly to port pins for instance for the and uh, because I, you know, access the status registers and things like that, serial for me was much easier from that standpoint. But, but uh, Winforth, it seems to be pretty good, and I'm able to do what I need to do. So uh, that also works too, because, like I said, I oftentimes use a serial interface to talk to almost everything. Like, like uh, I have a uh, lately, I've been fiddling with the little uh, blue, the blue pills, right? Because they're 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 so so cheap they're like two bucks a piece, <laughs> and 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 I I don't even use the USB capability of of the of the Bluetooth I I mean of the uh, of the blue pill I just leave it on serial and I always talk to it through serial so that, that works fine for me I can download upload and all that stuff so interesting stuff. What's a blue pill, please? Oh, it's a um, uh, it's similar to the little Arduino minis. It's but it's but it's not. But you can use the Ar Arduino interface to talk to them. But then you have to use their 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 loader, which you have to waste some space on your blue pill for. But um, the uh, uh, I I don't use a loader. I just go directly to fourth. So I have fourth on it that I took Dr. Tink's e, one of his E fourths and, and modified it to work with it. It uh, uses the uh, STM, um, what is it? STM, uh, I think it's STM 410, no, it's not the four. It's a 103, 103 CA or something like that. It has it has reasonable amount of RAM. It has uh, it also has flash and also uh, uh, what do they call it? The other one, uh, E squared. So it's got E squared that you would normally use from your program. Flash that you would use to hold your uh, your original source, you know, program and stuff like that. And then uh, the blue the blue pill usually comes with. Uh, uh, 20k of 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 RAM that you can use, so and it's uh, there's a there's a lot of variables on on how to use it, but other than that, uh, I just go to the uh, ST Micros webpage for the manual for the hardware, and I can do all of the various hardware functions that I want with it. <coughs> I've had some some interesting glitches in it that. Uh, Right, and you have to. Uh, the, it's a, it's actually there's a there's a little bit of information in one of the uh, 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 what do you call it in their error stuff to 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 help you through that. But the trouble is, is unless you really understand what's wrong with the chip in the first place, why it, why it has trouble bringing up the S, the spy, uh, it's it's when it when it when you write a change of mode into it. It just sends it all out to the wires. There's there's no synchronization to it, and so it get it initially thinks it's in the wrong mode before it goes into the right mode, and so you have to clear clear it clear it, you know the spy mode, and then get it working. There's a lot of help on the uh, uh, on the web. You can also put uh, MyCrisp on it, which is a which is a really nice. It's available on. Uh, on uh, on GitHub, and uh, you can you can put that on it as well. You don't have to use E4. I just like E4. I I I don't like my 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 crisp is more like the kitchen sink. Uh, and there's also a uh, another thing on on GitHub. Uh, it's GB Labs or something like that. He has he has quite a fit, bit of. Uh, examples to use some of the features on the uh, on the uh, on that chip as well so 
And uh, it's relatively easy since they are written in fourth, they're easy to convert back and forth to E fourth or, or whatever. But uh, uh, those are those are all all available on 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 GitHub. Uh, if you want to play with the uh, uh, the the E fourth, you can download my my version of it. Uh, it's slightly modified from what uh, Dr. Ting had for uh, another SDM part. Why don't never... you put your uh, link to that uh, hey. on the chat? Okay. <laughs> and say yeah. next month, could you just briefly describe your uh, development environment and the tool chain and how you go about getting a, a blue pill to do something? Uh, yeah, I could do that. Um, uh, the, uh, I would actually first rather uh, talk about my uh, uh, 4004 simulation that I used to recover a piece of software that was poorly printed on a ASR 33. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a program that I got from um, uh, the, uh, was that Calhoun Library, which is the library for the Monterey Peninsula, uh, Monterey, not Monterey Postgraduate School, Naval Postgraduate School Library. <clears throat> and it is a a program which I've actually implemented in real hardware. And so you're going to keep us from colliding into another ship next month, and then maybe the month after that, do blue pill. Would that be yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. It's, okay, uh, you're on the hook for two months. Wow, thank you so much. You you got me. <laughs> the uh, <clears throat> I I. If you remember correctly, I, I did a little bit of talk about uh, vividly about the, about the um, uh, uh, electronic uh, what I call it the electronic uh, uh, maneuver board. And, uh, tell us and, again who wrote that. Uh, gosh, I don't remember the guy's name. I'd have to look it up. Uh, but anyhow. It was written by 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 two students that that were at the the Monterey uh, uh, Postgraduate School, Naval Postgraduate School, and they were working under their professor, who just happened to be um, uh, Kildall, Gary Kildall. Yes. So it's it's young guy. Yeah, yeah, and, and for those that don't know who he is, <laughs> and. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so he he had gotten hardware from from Intel as quote defective hardware is what he called it. So, 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 so in other words, it was hardware they were quote throwing away unquote, and then he would give that to his students and let them play with it. So, uh, I wanted to I had an extra four thousand four processor and I wanted to actually make something work with it because a processor without doing anything, it's kind of useless. So, so I downloaded this, this code, that the code listing that they had, which was uh, uh, obviously printed on a platen that had been beat to death because oftentimes the right quarter of each character was cut off. And so most of the stuff I was able to pig, figure out, you know, the difference between P and F is, is oftentimes you can kind of figure by the context. But the problems I had is a lot of places they used uh, hex, hex values, and the, the letter C and the, and the number zero look almost exactly the same with the right half, half miss, or the right quarter missing. So there was a lot of work in there in debugging, which of course is what I wanted to talk about the simulator, the 4004 simulator that I, that I wrote and that I used to help debug that code and get it actually operational before I, I built the hardware. And actually now I have real hardware that actually does, does the, uh, the, the 4004 stuff, which is fun. <coughs> okay. And, and blue, blue, blue pill is pretty straightforward. There's changes I want to make to my blue pill, but it's it's okay for right now. Uh, I wanted to move. Um, right now, I, I basically kind of download the whole fourth into RAM. But what I really want to do, <coughs> excuse me, 
I want to segment it so so my uh, the, the 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 compiler words would all be what all was all stay in flash only and only the 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 words that you're that you that you need as uh, I don't know how to describe that that you need to modify would be in 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 the RAM area. You don't put those in the flash. So I would have two different places for for putting the dictionary. And I just have got around to actually finishing that off. The uh, the ARM instruction set is really goofy looking. Uh, the, the fields on it are not nicely oriented. I don't know if anybody's actually looked at the ARM code very much. It's 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 really screwy how they've divided things up. I'm sure they had some good hardware reasons for it, but I can't understand half of why they divided things up the way that Risk they did. Five is very but, similar. What they'll do is uh, they'll do that to minimize transistors, but also wire length inside the inside the uh, the processor's core as well, and that that really helps uh, with improving clock speed and lowering power. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure it, it, they have good reason for it. It's just very painful for if you're handwriting assembly code. <laughs> at, like at like I said, level. risk risk five is exactly the same way, and it's it's uh, it, it's uh, intimidating. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. Okay. Well, anyhow, back to uh, back to our 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 fourth stuff. I can talk about this other stuff later. Next week. <laughs> Okay, Kevin, you got it. Got to put your on mute it again. Okay, it's uh, not next week, but rather next month. Uh, oh yeah, the link next... will be the same. Uh, yeah, next the, month. Uh, yeah. Password will be the same. The uh, meetup agenda will be posted hopefully a little bit earlier. Uh, sorry, I was very busy this uh, this past week and did not uh, get it up on Wednesday, which is the goal. Uh, but you know how goals are. Uh, sometimes they aren't met. So uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was that on Meetup right now, you can go and uh, say, yes, you'll be there uh, in April. And uh, I was going to do it at 3 a.m. just to see how long Dennis would take to uh, actually subscribe to the meetup. But he, uh, <laughs> I figured it was better to do it while I, uh, while it had my attention. And uh, Dennis was, I think, 30 seconds after the, uh, the message. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. See, and I'm not programming in fourth anymore. <laughs> Had to do something. <laughs> well, should we? Um, I, I had the recording going, but I, um, I, shall I pull the plug on it? Uh, uh, not quite yet. Uh, we may uh, find that there's some interest in the after the meeting blather if you can make okay. a particular seg segment of the uh, after the meeting uh, of your make a particular YouTube video out of the after the meeting blather. Do you think it's worth it or certainly, should we stop? Certainly. No, no. I wanted to uh, say that uh, anybody that has a, uh, a thought for a programming challenge I, uh, I posted one sort of tongue in cheek in the chat, uh, but uh, you could implement that and uh, others could do it if, uh, if Bill is willing to host it. Uh, if you have thoughts for that, uh, we are kind of low on time to talk about it right now, but think about it. Uh, you can communicate with me uh, through Meetup or, or my email address. Uh, the uh, other thing uh, I wanted to do was plug uh, the only fourth engine on the market that you can buy from Amazon, as far as I know right now, uh, is James Bowman's uh, Dazzler uh, HDMI uh, or Arduino form factor uh, display board. So, uh, if you can write a program for the 
Adafruit Metro A4 in fourth uh, to display on the Dazzler. That might be an interesting challenge as well. Uh, if you want one and can't afford one, maybe drop me a line. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll give you mine because <laughs> at the rate I'm going, I don't know how much use of it use uh, I'm going to get out of mine. They're uh, relatively inexpensive, but not free. Uh, I think I posted a link on Amazon to the blue pill. It's you get two of them and uh, I think a USB interface uh, for 20 bucks uh, or thereabouts which is pretty impressive. Mm. All right. So if anybody has anything else, uh, I'd like to go around the list and uh, individually tell me where you are. And uh, that should uh, take us to the, to the end. Uh, I'm Kevin Appert, and I'm in Sunnyvale right now, so Sunnyvale, California, USA. So uh, next on my list of participants, of which there were 25 or so at the peak, which is pretty pretty darn good. Uh, I have asked James to come talk to us. Uh, so far, he's otherwise engaged, as you might expect, of somewhat of his uh, of his uh, capabilities and. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it can't be easy cranking an actual product out, I think, pretty much single handed that uh, deals with something as arcane as uh, getting HDMI to work on everything as he actually bought a slightly used uh, device that. Uh, I guess is uh, the HDMI logic analyzer. I, I recommend his newsletter if you're not uh, if you're not willing to fork over the money right away. Just uh, subscribe to his newsletter. Uh, it's uh, one of these uh, things that gets mailed out by a service, but uh, it's it's just amazing. But yes, uh, Ken, uh, we'll we'll get James in here as soon as we can, maybe for fourth day. Okay, so uh, on the list here of participants, Bill Ragsdale is the next one after me. So, Bill, where are you? I'm on my back patio. Look over my shoulder for the waterfall. We uh, redirected the local stream, and it floats into the hot tub. Life is so rough. But what town are you in? <laughs> it's Yolo County, uh, Yolo. <laughs> it's Woodland, which is in Yolo County, uh, about 80 miles north of Sacramento or San Francisco. The county that they named after you only live once. Uh, <laughs> we, Brad? Love, we love the T-shirts. We say those Yolo T-shirts all over. <laughs> Brad, you're up. Uh, I am in Mountain View. Um, <laughs> much, much as I have been for yay the past year. <laughs> Your audio is breaking up. Dennis, where are you? I'm in San Jose. Um, putting a, and employed remotely working at home. Pat Caffrey. Oakland, California, right in the Lake Merritt District. Dave Jaffe. Um, I'm in Mountain View. Um, yeah, Mountain View, California, USA, Earth. Dave is the uh, website host uh, and otherwise incredibly busy with his day job. So he's, he's going to change the date of the next meeting on the homepage pretty soon and maybe, uh, fix some other things. Right. <laughs> if you want yeah. helpful advice on things to fix, <laughs> which, right. sure. well, I've been busy with my course, which has, uh, you know, just ended. So I'll be uh, focusing on, on the, uh, SV big and big websites. Yes, we should all be grateful for our day jobs and not uh, interest ourselves in uh, 
SV fig to the extent that we uh, aren't. Uh... All right, Dr. Ting. Okay, I'm in California in the San Mateo, uh, city of San Mateo in the county of San Mateo. Okay. Just down the road from the former uh, building of Applied Biosystems where we used to meet. Yeah. Which, which used to be a company and is now not only not a company of its own, but uh, that building has been demolished in favor of new construction. Does anybody know what happened to the wedge? Is that still there? Or has that been dissolved too? Uh, what was that college that we used to meet at uh, in the South Bay? Uh, Cogsworth. Cogswell? No, that was in Sunnyvale. Uh, oh. Cogswell is still there as far as I know, but I think that the uh, building that we used to meet uh, at in the early 80s, uh, I think they threw us out as, uh, as no ne'er-do-wells. All right, uh, Ken. Hi, Kevin. I'm back home in uh, in England, um, a little place called Red Hill that's 20 miles due south of central London. All right, so uh, Norm. <laughs> Huh. At the Cheers uh, Bar in Boston, I believe. Well, this norm is in Indy Atlantic, Florida. Hmm. So, uh, Dwight, Dwight, where the heck are you? Uh, I'm mostly in San Jose, sometimes in Santa Cruz, but uh, <laughs> mostly in San Jose. I'm here here now. Um, what else is there? San Jose, California. And also, uh, uh, I, st I still work. I should be retired. Uh, at 73, I, I keep saying I'll retire, but I haven't retired yet. Uh, I, I work for AMD, and I can't tell you anything about our products because I always get, I'll get in trouble for that. But I, but I, but I, uh, uh, my, my main job is, is, uh, test uh, uh, test structures that we put on our chips. A lot of people don't realize that there's about 2% of the chip is test structures. And uh, most people don't see that part when they actually buy it. So interesting stuff. So hopefully all the arithmetic comes out with the right answer. Actually, I, I mainly uh, do what they call structural test, which means even if they design it wrong, I make sure the chip actually is that wrong. <laughs> if it agrees with the spec, I mean, you know. No one cares about the chip, they care about the spec. <laughs> They buy the spec. And then they return it when the chip doesn't meet the spec. Correct. <laughs> or they try to overclock it beyond the spec. Mm -hmm. RCS, who the heck are you? No voice at video. He's in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh -huh. Joe O'Connor's not in Boston. No, I am not. At least not right now. I'm in central Connecticut, a town called Meriden. Well, soon we'll be having uh, bars and uh, libraries that have broadband. Maybe we'll one of us will be uh, participating from there. Okay. Willem, V-I-L-E-M, if I'm mispronouncing it, uh, my apologies. He's in the Czech Republic. Hmm. 
So anybody that I've missed, uh, feel free to put your uh, your uh, location up in the chat. Uh, make it fast because we're only going to be blathering for another minute. Uh, I yeah. think that at this point, hit the record button. Uh, there's no ceremony for this, but uh, we'll have the uh, non-ceremonial uh, ending of the recording. Brad? <laughs>